keep your bedroom cool, um, probably around about 18 degrees Celsius, which is colder than most people think. But cooling the room down takes your body into that right sort of thermal space for good sleep. It cools it down. Darkness we've spoken about too, but we are, I think, a dark-deprived society in this modern era, and you need darkness at night to allow the release of a hormone called melatonin, which helps time the healthy onset of your sleep. So yes, it's to do with blue light, sort of emitting devices, screens, phones. Those are things that you should try and stay away from in the last hour before bed. But it's not just that; it's also overhead lighting. You know, we don't need to be bathed in electric light all night. In the last hour before bed, just try turning half of the lights off in your flat or in your home. You'd be surprised at how soporific and sleepy you become when you're shrouded in darkness. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing is, I would say, walk it out. And what I mean by that is, don't stay in bed if you've been awake for twenty or twenty-five minutes, either trying to fall asleep or you've woken up and you're trying to get back to sleep. The reason is because your brain is this wonderfully associative device, and it will start to very quickly learn that being in bed is about being awake rather than asleep. So what you need to do is, after about twenty-five minutes, just relax, understand that sleep is not quite here yet. Go to a different room in dim light, read a book or listen to a podcast,、um, but don't check email, don't eat because it trains your brain to expect that in the middle of the night. Only return to bed when you are very sleepy, and that way your brain will start to relearn the association that your bedroom is the place of sleep rather than the place. Of I think、sleep. that's a really important tip, Matthew. That you know, I know even from our first conversation on Facebook, but you know, whenever I talk about sleep, you know, people can often. Get really wound up about this and say, you know, I'm I'm doing all those things. I I can't sleep, and they've, you know, they've they've really just, you know, without without trying to, their brain has just got into this position where it's been trained not to sleep. It's been trained to not associate the bedroom with sleep. Or you know, so many people I see, you know, when I hear about on social media, are doing work emails right up to the moment they fall asleep. And and、yeah. you know, you we mentioned children before, and I I, I often say, you know. Children need a bedtime routine. We know that.、Right? <laughs> Why, as adults, do we think we're any different? We should, and and you're absolutely right. You know, we've turned the bed、uh, in this day and age often, you know, into a kitchen. We've turned it into an office. We've turned it into a cinema. <laughs> you know, we do all of these things typically on the bed, which then it does impact the brain's association. It gets quite confused about what this thing called the bed is is all about.、Um, so I think that that's a That's a very helpful tip, and try not to get too anxious if you're sort of falling asleep. I know that probably a lot of what I've been telling people will make you feel anxious if you're not being able to get the sleep that you need. But try not to worry about it. Everyone has a bad night of sleep. Just get up, understand that you're going to be awake for a little bit longer, and then go back to bed, and and you will start to relearn that association. And and in fact, a lot of、um, you know people and patients will say to me, well, you know, I've been falling asleep on the settee watching television. And then I get into bed and I'm wide awake and I don't know why. And again, it's because of this association that you've learned with the bed. The final two things,、um, one of which we've mentioned, is what you intake into your body: caffeine and alcohol. We've spoken about caffeine, but I'll speak about alcohol quickly. Many people use、uh, alcohol as a sleep aid, and it is anything but an assistant to sleep. Alcohol is a class of drugs that we call the sedatives,、um, and sedation is not sleep. Unfortunately,、yeah. it's very, sedation is not sleep. It's very it. different.、Um, so, what you're doing when you have a nightcap or you use alcohol to try and get to sleep, and many people do, understandably so, they mistake one for the other. You're just knocking your cortex out. You're not in natural sleep. The two other problems with alcohol and sleep: firstly, alcohol will fragment your sleep. So if I were to record someone's sleep in the laboratory after they've had a couple of drinks, their sleep is littered with all of these awakenings throughout the night. Now you tend not to remember waking up, but the next day you feel again unrefreshed. You don't feel sort of bright and alert or restored by your sleep, but you don't remember waking up, so you don't link it to the alcohol. But alcohol is bad at fragmenting your sleep; produces poor quality. The final thing alcohol is good at doing is blocking your dream sleep or your REM sleep, and we know to come back to our conversation, REM sleep is critical for emotional first aid. REM sleep provides、um, overnight therapy; it's a form of emotional convalescence, and alcohol will block that REM sleep quite viciously.
So those would be the five tips, I think, for better sleep. Yeah, Matthew, thanks. I, I love that. Um, just, just to say on alcohol, is it dose dependent? So, for example, you know, some people say, well, I'm OK with one glass of wine, but two or three glasses is going to fragment my sleep. You know, it, can you comment on, on the dosage there? Or would you advise people who are struggling with sleep yeah. to knock it on its head, basically? I know, and I, it's so hard for me to answer this. And this is the reason, one of the re- many reasons why I'm such a deeply unpopular person. But um, I don't think that's know, fair to say, but... <laughs> I, 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 but, you know, I... Firstly, I don't want to sound puritanical. You know, life is to be lived yeah. to a degree. And all of these things that we're discussing, oh, we're trying to speak about the extremes. Um, but I also want to empower people with the knowledge. I'm not here to tell you necessarily what you should or you shouldn't do. I just want to give you the scientific facts and then you can make the choice. I would say, unfortunately, that even just one glass of alcohol in the evening we can we can see that we can measure that you can measure that in your lab you can see that you're not getting the same deep level of restorative sleep even with one drink even with one drink so i know it's hard but now you know everyone you know should you know have a social life and sort of you know enjoy a drink now and again i think the best advice would be this if you're going to bed feeling tipsy you probably have had too much alcohol in terms of sleep impairment well i i think you know i i so resonate with it with so much of what you've just said which is you know this podcast, what I do, what you do, it's not about telling people what to do. You know, I've, I've got no interest of telling someone what they should do. I have no right to tell someone yeah, what they should do with their do. lives. Yeah. Um, what I think we're trying to do is to educate people, inspire them, empower them to understand what lifestyle choices they're making and how that could impact their health. And I, I, I always draw the analogy with going out, how many of you drinks with your mates on a Friday night? People know intuitively that if I go out for a drink on a Friday night and have three or four pints, let's say, you know what, my Saturday morning might be a bit of a write-off. I may not be functioning as well as I might want to. But you're going into that with that knowledge. You're saying, you know, I know the effect alcohol has on me, but I'm going to get so much enjoyment out of my night out tonight that I'm willing to put up with the consequences. What I think we're both trying to say is guys we just want to empower you we want to help you understand the impact that caffeine might be having on your sleep that alcohol might be having on your sleep that the fact that you're on your work emails before you go to bed might be having on your sleep do with that information what you will you know um that's how i would put it i i I so agree because i think you know a lot of you know what you speak about um in your book which is you know far more wide-ranging than mine because i just take one of the things you go after four of the key the the key pillars (laughs) which is so much more impressive i think says so much about the difference between uh, me and 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 you rangan but well no you're a recent i'm I'm a clinician right there's a big difference right there there is but I, i still think it's it's a it's a heroic thing but what i would say i think is that Yes, a lot of people are aware of some of these things, you know, like it's good to be physically active, you know, I should try and stay away from drinking too much alcohol. But I also think that there's a lot of what we discuss, you know, I hope in both books, that is perhaps knowledge that people aren't aware of. And if only that they were aware of it, they would actually want to do something different. That's the sort of the case that I'm really passionate about, is that people as long as you know the information and you choose to do otherwise, no problem at all. A lot of people just are either misinformed or entirely when it comes to sleep, uninformed. That's the goal. That is the goal. And it's, and it's really about, it's that empowerment piece. And, and this is one thing I just want to end on is just to say, guys, look, it may not be that you can just change one thing and suddenly have a great night's sleep. You might have to change three or four things together you know that's certainly my experience it's like you know Matthew you know you're a researcher so a lot you know you'll do research and and showing what caffeine does on showing what alcohol does and but I would say as a clinician use that research but maybe you might have to try a few things like you might try for example one week with no caffeine and no alcohol and see how you sleep because then you can be empowered to just to decide what you're going to do after that are you going to go back or maybe then I always try and get people sleeping as well as they've ever slept. Then they can start reintroducing some of these lifestyle things that they want. And they can say, oh, wow, that's interesting. I I felt great last week, but now when I have a 2 p.m. coffee, you know what? I'm not quite as good. Okay, that's going to teach me now that... I'm going to I'm going to knock it a bit earlier in the day because I think ultimately nobody is going to follow your advice or my advice simply because we told them to. I think it's only when they start to feel the difference themselves. Yeah. They go, wow, you know, I kind of like feeling good. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, I love your point about just trying to give it time to, you know, sleep and starting to change your sleep and seeing the effects of getting better sleep. It's a little bit like exercise at the gym. You know, you're not going to go to the gym one day and wake up looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, it just takes some time. But if you commit to it, you will see gradual change. And it's the same thing with with sleep as well. But I also think I love the idea of you, you know, putting sleep in that bedrock place and then starting to introduce the other factors. What's lovely is that many of them will actually fall in place when sleep is stabilized. And I'll yeah. give you a good example of diet. We know that um, without sufficient sleep, two critical appetite hormones go in opposite bad directions. Yeah. One of those hormones is called leptin, which is a hormone that sort of signals to your body you're full, you're, you don't want to eat anymore. The other hormone is called ghrelin, which does the opposite. It says you're not satisfied with your food. You want to eat more. Um, and despite leptin and ghrelin sounding like two hobbits, they are actually real <laughs> hormones. Um, what's interesting is that when you sleep deprive people or even just limit them to maybe just like five or six hours of sleep for a week, levels of leptin, which say you're full, don't eat more, they drop down. Levels of ghrelin that ramp up your hunger and say, I've just eaten a big meal, but I'm not satisfied. I want to eat more that hormone skyrockets when you're underslept. So no wonder people who are sleeping just five to six hours a night will actually eat on average somewhere between two to 300 extra calories every single day. Yeah. It's... So you can solve sleep and you will actually start to not want to eat as much. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is why a part of weight loss is to sleep better. It's yeah. a critical factor. And I think next time I get you on, Matthew, we'll, we'll probably go into detail on that. We'll probably go into detail on Alzheimer's and maybe even things like menopausal symptoms and hormonal symptoms that I also see sleep deprivation playing a huge role in. I know you're on a really busy schedule. That's what happens when you have such a popular international best-selling book. <laughs> well, and you know all about that too. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I'd highly encourage you to pick up Matthew's book, Why We Sleep. It's it's absolutely brilliant. It's got pretty much everything you've ever wanted to know about sleep. I think you'll probably find in that book. Um, I look forward to when you release a later edition, when you've got newer research coming out in the future at some <laughs> points. But Matthew, one question I, I like to ask my my guests who are, you know, leading researchers in the field is, you know, as you became more and more aware of all this sleep research, what was the biggest thing in your own lifestyle that you changed on the back of your research? I think it was probably caffeine. Um, I think just seeing the data and then doing those types of studies ourselves and Particularly the the finding that we discussed were even if you're asleep, the quality of that sleep is just not as deep. That really got me concerned, and that's when I really started to pay attention to my to my caffeine content. Um, and are you and tea turtle now with caffeine, or are you? So right now, yeah, I am. I drink decaffeinated tea and I drink decaffeinated coffee. Um, I sometimes, you know, I've ebbed and flowed between sort of having coffee in the morning. Um, because I do feel it's it's alerting benefits, but you know we didn't necessarily evolve to be medicated with caffeine. And I think anyone who's you know drinking caffeine at eleven a.m., which on the basis of your circadian rhythm, if you lift, listen to the wonderful podcast with uh, Sachin Panda that you did, you know your peak of your circadian rhythm is right around sort of the eleven o'clock period. That's when it should be almost impossible for you to fall asleep. But yet, you know, I sometimes look around on an airplane when I'm leaving and people, <laughs> half the plane is asleep at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Um, and if you're self-medicating um, your sleep deprivation at 11 a.m. with caffeine, it usually means that you're perhaps just not getting enough sleep. And that's probably been one of the greatest, um, I think, influential factors. That and the impact on my productivity, I think that was the, the most underrated. And it actually forced me to start doing a lot of research on sleep loss and productivity that maybe on a second podcast we can what talk we about. What we can get but, into, yeah. But, you know, my ability to re maintain focus and produce high quality output work is dramatically dependent on the sleep that I've been having at night. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. Everybody has to learn how to do this. Your whole life gets better. Learning to control your nervous system will change everything. The foundational practice that I truly believe every person should do every day is